Welcome everyone. Uh, I am so excited to be here with you tonight. Uh, my name is Karin Broberg. Uh, I am the program coordinator for the In Our Own Voice program, uh, which is uh, In Our Own Voice is what you're going to be hearing tonight. So I just want to welcome you all. Thank you so much for joining us this evening uh, and for prioritizing mental health. Uh, so I'm going to start with just a really quick introduction about NAMI NYC and our services. Uh, for those of you who might be, um, this is maybe your first time joining a NAMI NYC event, uh, or if you want to learn a little bit more about the support that we offer. Uh, so NAMI stands for the National Alliance on Mental Illness. Uh, NAMI is a national nonprofit. We're the largest um, mental health grassroots organization in the country. Uh, and we, of course, come from NAMI's local New York City organization. So I wanted to share a little bit about our services. Uh, we offer all sorts of support, education, advocacy, and outreach, uh, both for people who uh, live with mental health challenges themselves, but also for family members and friends. So for anyone who maybe you have someone in your life who's struggling with mental health, uh, we also have support for you. Um, in terms of the support that we have at NAMI NYC, we have classes, support groups, as well as a fantastic phone helpline. Uh, all of our programming is completely free to access. Um, and for example, for our support groups, you can literally just drop in like uh, you did today. Uh, you don't even have to sign up ahead of time to join one of our over 40 support groups. Uh, we have programming both virtual like we are tonight uh, as well as in-person programming at our office in Midtown Manhattan. Uh, I should also mention that all of our programming is peer-led. Uh, what that means is basically if you're joining a support group for people who are living with a mental health condition, it's going to be facilitated by someone who also lives with a mental health condition. And if you're joining our uh, groups or classes for family members, that's going to be facilitated by someone who's a family member themselves. So that's a really important part of what we do at NAMI NYC. We want to make sure that we're creating an open and accepting atmosphere and that when you reach out to NAMI NYC for help, you're being met by someone who can really understand and empathize with what you're going through. Um, I really encourage everyone to check out NAMINYC.org. That's our website, and you can find lists there of all the different classes, support groups, and other events and uh, programming that we offer. Uh, like I said, we have over 40 different support groups, so I do not have time to go into all of them uh, in detail. Uh, but of course, we're going to open up for questions later on. So if anyone has a question about NAMI NYC, feel free to ask that later. Um, and like I said, we have a fantastic phone helpline that you can call, either if you want to learn more about NAMI NYC services, if you are trying to access other mental health services around the city and you need help with that, or if you just want to talk with someone who, who can empathize and understand. So I'm going to drop the uh, phone number uh, and hours for our helpline into the chat here. So feel free to save that for uh, any time you might need it. Uh, and I think that is all that I wanted to share with you today. Uh, I'm going to hand it over to our amazing In Our Own Voice volunteer presenters. Uh, I think starting with Marina. Hi, everyone. My name is Marina. Um, I live in New York City. I moved to New York when I was 19 years old. I moved from um, Belgium. Before that, um, I lived in Romania, where I was born. And um, I'm looking forward to um, having this Zoom tonight with all of you. And now I'm going to introduce you to my co-presenter, Miss Lady Charmaine. Thank you. Hello, beautiful. My name is Lady Charmaine Day. A little bit about me. I'm originally from Roosevelt, Long Island, home of Eddie Murphy, Public Enemy, <laughs> Howard Stern, Dr. J and my family. I have over 25 years human resources executive experience. And for fun, I'm really into Facebook. I have a Facebook fan page and group I love sharing information on. And tonight we'll be doing an on-voice presentation. 
divided into three sections. What happened, what snacks, and what helps. During each section, we'll pause to share our personal story and to ask you questions. During the what happened section, we'll be sharing our dark days and they can be dark. So we ask that you take care of yourself during that time, but please stay to the end because the presentation ends on a high positive note. So now that we've introduced ourselves, now that we've introduced the introduction, I'm gonna turn it back over to Marina for her to share what happened to her. Marina? Thank you, Miss Lady Charmaine. So, I started my journey with uh, my mental health condition when I was 23 years old. I was first misdiagnosed with um, clinical depression. So during my time in college, I started to feel very depressed and everybody used to tell me, you know, it's normal. You're far away from your family, working multiple jobs. It it's totally normal. and. Inside of me, I just knew something was wrong because I couldn't understand how I could feel so much pain. Um, barely made it through college. I graduated. And then, of course, things got worse. I ended up getting a job and getting health insurance, which allowed me to go see a therapist and a psychiatrist. And that's when I was uh, diagnosed with um, bipolar disorder, borderline personality, PTSD, and anxiety disorder. Um, the journey from there <laughs> went from bad to worse. Um, and it was 10 years of struggle trying to find the right medication for me. Um, my body was resistant to most of the medication, so I was very up and down. And in 2016, um, I hit a breaking point in my life. I decided that I was gonna stop the medication that I was on um, just because I was very angry. I had a lot of resentment and I just thought, well, the medication are not helping me. So what's the point of taking them? So long story short, I went into psychosis. And from there, I made some very poor decision and it ended up with me serving 13 months in a state prison upstate. Um, that was probably the moment that my whole life changed. Um, between that, going from the moment when I was diagnosed to uh, being arrested, I had to try uh, three, three, uh, sorry, three suicidal attempts. I had two psychiatric hospitalizations. I used to self arm myself almost every day for 10 years, but prison kind of was the turning point and changed a lot of things for me. So before we get into that, I'm gonna let Lady Charmaine uh, talk about what happened to her. Thank you, Marina. What happened to me was that from the very beginning, I suffered from dark days. From zero to five, my father was both physically and mentally abusive to me and my family. Then my mother and father divorced when I was five years old, and my mother married my stepfather. And my stepfather repeatedly sexually abused me and was mentally abusive towards me from ages five to nine. The only thing that hadn't been poked, prodded, or touched in any way was my brain. And early on, my teachers told me, they said, look, Charmaine, you're smart. Go for that. But the kids in school were cruel and bullying me. In the wintertime, they would throw me in the snow. In the fall, they were throwing me in the leaves. And I kept praying. I said, God, please let my hard work and all A's pay off. And it did. In my senior year, I was my senior class president, homecoming queen, yearbook editor, public announcer, and I graduated number three in my class, which was good enough to get me into Cornell University. At Cornell, I worked two or three jobs, and I was very active in student life. One of the things I wanted to do while at Cornell was pledge a black sorority, and I did. I pledged Delta Sigma Theta. But this was spring 1991 when they changed the pledge process to no pledging activities. However, for 13 weeks, me and 12 of the girls went through a pledge process. 
Nationals heard about it. They came in, suspended and fined the girls. They suspended and fined the chapter. And me and the girls that I pledged with, we did not get our letters. To have pledged for 13 long, hard weeks and not get my letters, I felt suicidal. But I didn't act on it. I continued to do well, and I was actually inducted into the Quill and Dagger Senior Honor Society, and I graduated from Cornell with honors on time. But my family on my father's side noticed I was depressed, and they kept saying, girl, all you need is a man. A man will cheer you up and make you feel better. So they set me up on a blind date with a friend of the family who asked me to marry him four months after dating me. We got married a year and a half later. And I would say that that relationship wasn't the greatest. He was always treating me like I was nothing, and I felt like I was nothing. So it was November 1997. I hadn't slept for three days trying to figure out how am I going to get out this marriage. I started walking fast and talking fast and having speeding irrational thoughts like, hey, I'm Wonder Woman, and I can change the world. I went on my job. I was working in human resources. I called a meeting of all the secretaries and I told them, look, you're all incompetent and fired. They looked at me like, what? Then I went to Columbia while I was working on my master's. I told my teacher, sit down, shut up. I'm smarter than you and I am in the class today. He took one look at me. He said, something is wrong with you. He called my husband, and my husband and family took me to the psych ward, where I stayed for two weeks. I was diagnosed with having bipolar disorder. When I came out, my hands were shaking. I was drooling. I was staring into space. I couldn't color coordinate. Everyday activities was difficult. Even sex was difficult. So being diagnosed with bipolar disorder and then being hospitalized 10 more times after that is what happened to me. So for me, um, what helped was ironically prison. Um, I often said in my previous presentation that prison saved my life, but I think I should have, I should correct that. Prison was probably the most traumatic thing that ever happened to me. Uh, but what saved me is the people that I met in prison. And the reality is in prison, there is not much to do honestly. So for somebody who was always running away from her problems and her thoughts, I couldn't run anymore because there was no place to run. So I had to face my demons. And I, something being worse than being in prison is being hospitalized in prison. And while I was hospitalized, there was a very nice officer. His name was Mr. Smith. And Mr. Smith approached me and he's like, what are you doing here? You know, you kind of don't look like you belong here. I didn't really understand what he meant at the time, but I just remember being so scared because I thought that I was going to die in prison. I remember saying goodbye to a few friends and my parents. And in my head, I was like, that's it. I'm going to die in prison. So Mr. Smith first helped me understand that I was not going to die in prison. And he also made me understand that maybe for the first time in my life, I had the possibility to finally face all my problems. Because for one year, I was I, nobody was asking me to work. Nobody was asking me to pay bills. The only thing I had to do was to be with my thoughts and journal, which I started to do. And he told me some two things that were very important to me. One was that this mistake didn't have to define me. People will rem not remember the mistake, but they will remember how you manage the mistake. And he saw how heartbroken I was when I was in prison because I was like, you know, this is it. I'm never going to recover from this. My life is over. And he's like, no, your life is not over. It's like, this is a, in the journey of your entire life. This is a very small part. And he's like, maybe one day he's like, you're going to go out because I know you're going to get out of here. You're going to get out and you are going to go and you're going to help others by sharing your story. 
And I remember looking at him and thinking like, Mr. Smith, what are you talking about? I'm like, there is no way I'm going to talk about my story and that somebody is going to be interested to hear about what I have to say. But long story short, I got out of prison three years ago. And that's when I really started the healing process. And I kind of got my own little village. You know, they always say it takes a village to raise a kid. Well, I always say it takes a village to get me out of bed in the morning. And that village is made of very supportive friends, a life coach who's here tonight. And I'm so happy to, to see her on, on the Zoom. Mary, thank you so much for being here. Um, my doctor, my therapist, my psychiatrist, my wonderful friends. Unfortunately, my family doesn't understand mental illness because of the culture that I come from. I was born um, in Romania, which is an Eastern European country, and we don't really talk about mental illness. You know, they usually tell you that, well, stuff it up. You know, there is no such thing as depression. Um, so because I was able to create this community around me, that's when I started slowly the healing process. And of course, for me, it was the medication. I'm the type of person that cannot function without her medication. So slowly, I started to rebuild my life. Um, my first job out of prison, I was paid $14 an hour. I went from making six figures to $14 an hour, but I was so happy that somebody gave me a chance that I just didn't care. And it's I'm very proud to say now that three years later, I'm I'm finally on a journey where I, I'm starting to see the end of the tunnel. Um, it's not easy every day, but because I'm so grateful that I have this community around me, I'm able to function as anybody else. So now I'm gonna let Lady Charmaine explain what um, what helped her. Thank you, Marina. And what helps me is in terms of acceptance, treatment, and coping. In terms of acceptance, in 1997, when I was first diagnosed, you couldn't get me to believe I had a mental illness. I thought, given my history of trauma and abuse, that I had a nervous breakdown or a meltdown. So for the first five years of my diagnosis, I was like, no, 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 not me. I don't have a mental illness. Then in the fifth year, I stopped taking my medication for bipolar disorder, and I immediately ended up in the psych ward for a month. And my mother came to see me, and she was like, look, I have diabetes. It's a medical condition just like any other. I take my medicine. I am well. You have bipolar disorder. It's a medical condition just like diabetes. You take your medicine, you'll be fine. Your family and friends love you for who you are. Hearing that bipolar disorder was a medical condition, just like diabetes, I came to acceptance. I came to further acceptance when I learned about famous people who have bipolar, like DMX, Jean-Claude Van Damme, Nina Simone, Beethoven, Catherine Zeta-Jones, Mariah Carey, Carrie Fisher, Demi Lovato, and Sting. And because depression is part of bipolar, Hearing that Janet Jackson, Alicia Keys, Dolly Parton, Serena Williams, and Dwayne Johnson, The Rock, had depression, I'm like, I'm in good company. So acceptance came easier then, which helped me deal with my treatment. It took 15 years for them to get my medicine correct. So during that time, I suffered from severe side effects including my heart stopping four times. I had severe seizures. I went up to 215 pounds, down to 100 pounds, back up to 215. But finally, they got my medicine correct, and that consists of me taking an antipsychotic, anti-anxiety, and antidepressant. What they learned about me was a category of mood stabilizers was causing me to have severe side effects, and I can't take that. I see my psychiatrist once a month, and I check in twice a month with my therapist, and I check in every single day with my friends and family. And that's what helps me have a supportive community around me. I also try to make medicine time fun for me. So when I go on trips, I collect shot glasses like this. 
So when it's time for me to take my medicine, I'll get out a cute shot glass and I'll have some water, some juice, and I'll go, mmm, this is me loving like in me. And if I have to take my medicine and I'm on the road, I have this cute coach pill box. And people ask me all the time, they're like, what is this for? I'm like, this is for my medicine. And if you have to take medicine, you can get a coach box too. So by making medicine time fun for me, I make my treatment work. And coping is what I do to stay well. And the first coping strategy I implemented was learning to love and like myself and to accept myself and to treat me with love and care and commitment. And it took a lot of self-help, reading the Bible and therapy to get to this point. But now I love myself. And I say positive affirmations every single day, like God is in control. He did make a mistake when he made me and everything is going to be fine. The second coping strategy I practice is forgiveness. I have forgiven everyone who's done something wrong or negative towards me. And by doing that, I feel at peace and able to cope. I also journal or write in a diary. I've been writing in a diary since I was five years old. So two things, I have a lot of books to help me out and I have a lot of information to help me be better, which is really positive. I also exercise and eat healthy. Remember I told you I went up to 215 pounds. Well, by eating healthy and exercising, I have lost and kept off for the last 10 years, 80 pounds, something I'm very proud of. I also practice keeping the kid in me alive. I'm 53 years old. So I'm a child of the 70s. So I went back and collected childhood toys like the Snoopy Snow Cone Machine, the My Little People with the My Little People Schoolhouse. I got this Cabbage Patch doll my mom got me when I was nine. And I have over 250 African-American Barbie dolls. And Mattel must have heard about it because of two things. They made a Barbie movie. Nah, 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 nah. And they made a Barbie that looks just like me. <laughs> I also do acupuncture. Acupuncture helps with arthritis in my hands and knees and the bipolar in my head and menopause that I go through. I also do pet therapy. I have an uh, emotional support dog named Porky Poo, who I love and treats me with respect and unconditional love every day. And lastly, I do spirituality. I read my Bible every day and I pray every day. And by doing so, I feel connected to God and able to cope. And we have to move on to what's next. And Mar Marina, can you please share what's next for you? Yes. So what's next? Um, well, this year, actually this past year, 2023, um, I kind of fell a little bit off track and, um, you know, I've, I've had a, since I came back to, from prison three years ago, I've been very lucky that I was able to rebuild my professional life. I was able to rebuild my support system with a different group of friends. Um, like I said, I go to therapy once a week. I see my therapist once a week, my psychiatrist once a week. I see my life coach once a week. I take my medication uh, very religiously, um, but what I've what I've learned from the past year is that you know there are going to always be some bumps around the road, and there might they are not failures. Um, for me, I started a relationship last year, and it didn't go that well, unfortunately, and it kind of sent me on a really dark path. And I felt like I was failing everybody around me. And actually, it was just me having a step back. And because I've had this wonderful support system around me, I was able to kind of slowly get back on track. And what I'm doing now is the first thing is self-care. It's putting myself first. And by putting myself first, I'm able to be there for other people. I always say that my mental health condition is a lifestyle. Um, you know, some people go to the gym, some people like to take their vitamins. I take my meds um, and I consider my mental health condition 
a lifestyle that I didn't choose for myself, but it's something that I have to take care of it on a daily basis. And, you know, for me, it's surrounding myself with good people because my environment is so important because it affects my mood and triggers me very quickly. So I try to stay out of situation where I know might not be good for me or stay away from people that might not good, be good for me. Um, I try to set, like I said, small and bigger goals. Small goals is just like getting out of, of the morning and even being able to brush my teeth and going to work. Those are sometimes things that I'm just so grateful for because there was a time in my life that I couldn't do it. On the bigger goal is I want to become um, an advocate for prison reform and bringing mental health awareness in prison because unfortunately 85% of the population in prison suffer from mental illness. When I was in prison, I was allowed to see a, a therapist maybe every three or four months, which is really nothing. Um, so I'm working now with NAMI as an ambassador and going to Albany to, to work on all that. And um, lastly, it's forgiveness. Um, I'm still trying to forgive myself and forgive the people around me. And that's the healing process. And healing sometimes can be messy. Somebody, one of my closest friends told me, maybe it's this chapter in your life is called rebirth. And when you think about rebirth or birth, it's messy, it's painful, but in the same time, it's really beautiful. So this is what the, I will say the, the main point right now in my life where it's a lot of healing and a lot of trying to do the best I can. You know, I'm always the first person to say that I'm a work in progress. And as long as I have my community around me, I feel that I, I, I'm able to achieve anything. And I'm, I'm so grateful that a lot of them are on this Zoom tonight with me and, um, I wouldn't be here without them. I, I, you know, they give me the push that I need every single day. And for that, I'm extremely grateful. Lady Charmaine. Thank you, Marina, for sharing. And for me, what's next is in terms of success, hopes, and dreams. In terms of success, in 1997, when I was first diagnosed with bipolar disorder, I also started a master's program at Columbia University. So success is two years later, completing my master's degree from Columbia with honors in organizational psychology. I continue to work as the head of human resources for Fortune 50 and non-for-profit organizations. Then in 2008, I became a pastor of Unlimited Health Online Ministry. It's done through my website, ladycharmaineday.com, done through my social media, Lady Charmaine Day and done through my talk show, Taboo Talk. And Taboo Talk started off as a cable talk show in Manhattan in the Bronx. Then it became a radio show for 10 years on Blog Talk Radio, Amazon Music, and iTunes. And all kinds of shows of those are still on those radio stations. And now it's a podcast that can be seen on my YouTube and on my website, LadyCharmaineDay.com. In 2008, I joined NAMI and became an in on voice presenter that same year. Then in 2010, NAMI selected me to be a statewide trainer. And from 2010 to now, I've trained over 300 people. I even trained Marina, something I'm very proud of. Thank you, Ms. Chalmine. <laughs> that that yeah. was the best training ever. <laughs> Thank you. Then in 2009, NAMI New York City sent me to the Dr. Oz show. I guest started on the warning signs of depression. I spoke about weight gain because I was 215 pounds. But hello, I had a speaking part, and I was so happy about that. Then in 2019, NAMI selected me to be the focus of a, a video, WebMD, called Bipolar Relapse and Recovery. Success. In 2022, NAMI New York City selected me to receive their Volunteer of the Year Award for my contributions to their in on voice program. And in 2024, I was selected by the Consumer Advisory Board of the Bureau of Mental Health and Hygiene to be a board member of their board. 
<laughs> Thank you. Success. Remember, I told you I'm really into Facebook. Well, my high school sweetheart contacted me on Facebook in 2010, and we got married that same year. So, success now is being happily married for 14 years. My hope is to thank you. <laughs> my hope is to one day have a child, and my dream is to leave you with this bit of information. I choose to believe that there's hope for recovery from mental illness because it takes a lot of courage, dedication, perseverance, and fortitude to effectively deal with this condition. And by using those same skills in my personal life, I am successful. One of the accomplishments I have created as a being, using those skills is I'm a published author of eight books. And this year I published three more books. Now I'm a publisher of 11 books. I'm a published author of Do I Look Bipolar? The Lady Chardonnay Day Story. Taboo Talk. Poetry for My Soul. And Unlimited Help, A Book of Wisdom. And all my books sell on Amazon and my website. And I want you to know that I felt like this whole journey has been like a butterfly. A butterfly starts off as a caterpillar in a cocoon. It's all in the dark space, all alone, in the dark, without knowledge. And that's where I was when I was on the wrong meds, wrong diet, wrong therapist, wrong doctor. But once I got the right therapist, right doctor, acupuncturist, eating the right foods, and being healthy, I became a um, a butterfly. You got me too. Mm. <laughs> I became a butterfly. And, That's great. <laughs> and so now I'm living my best life ever. And I want to hope and encourage you to do the same. And now that we've come to the end, are there any final questions or comments? If I could just say one thing, Lady Charmaine, first of all, you are such an inspiration to me. I remember when we did our training together. Um, so happy to be presenting with you tonight. But something that I wanted to say <clears throat> in general is somebody just recently told me something that really made sense, which is every season has a beginning and an end. And it's kind of the same thing in life. There is the good times and the bad times you know, and they all start and finish at some point. And I think the main thing is just learning how to go through it during the good time. It's just to be grateful, grateful that you can have those moments in your life. And the bad time is kind of learning along the way the tools that will make it a little bit easier. Mm -hmm. And something that I wish I knew when I was struggling, um, you know, during of my life is that I was going through this really dark tunnel trying to figure out what mental illness was and how um, how to live with it and I so wish at the time that I knew that I didn't have to go through it alone because of the stigma of what it was to live with a mental illness you know meant to me I was so scared to share it with people and because I was scared of rejection you know, I wish I would learn that no matter what you go in truth life, it's so important to 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 share your struggle and to ask for help, you know, because everybody needs somebody. We all need somebody in our life. It can be a parent, it can be a friend, it can be a doctor, it can be a stranger. Um, so that's something that I try to remember remind myself also when I go through the hard time is that like, this shall pass too. And every time that something hard happens now, I try to remember that it's okay. I'm learning. This is going to be a learning lesson. So next time when it happens again, I will be able to deal with it better. And when the good time come back, I just learn to appreciate it and live in the moment instead of trying to think what's next. All right. Thank you so much, Marina. It's been a pleasure presenting with you. It's an honor to have trained you and now to present with you. You're a phenomenal person, and I'm so proud of you. 
And I know the advocacy that you're doing for the justice system is going to have a huge impact. Thank you so much.